All right, goalkeepers, welcome again to another episode of the GK webinar at TSC. Tonight I'm joined by my co-host and co-director of goalkeeping, EV, aka Eric Vodder, aka Gandalf of goalkeeping. Tonight we are going to talk through in possession philosophy as it uh, pertains to goalkeepers, as it pertains to our principles of play here at TSC and help with some of the decision-making process that comes in in the ball being at your feet. Coach, how are we doing tonight? Doing well. Glad everybody's joining us. Uh, you know, everybody, uh, this is, you know, Coach Lou and I always work with you on, you know, keeping the ball out of the goal, but uh, it, it, we're progressing now to, okay, we've kept the ball out of the goal or the other teams, you know, shot it over the end line and now we have a goal kick. Now we have the ball. What do we do? And um, you guys have often heard the goalkeeper is the last line of defense, but the goalkeeper is also the first line of attack. And, and sometimes in, in your games, you're going to, you're going to, to see this. And so that's what we're, we're doing this webinar for. So you have sort of rules of thumb on what is proper distribution. Great. So we'll go ahead and get started here. Evie, I'll get our presentation up and running for everyone and we'll get after it. All right. So for a little refresher, we'll start with the possession philosophy here at TSC. So when we have the ball. So if we think about the game, it's broken up into four cycles, attacking, Defending, transitioning from attacking to defending and transitioning from defending to attacking. So the two that are most important for goalkeepers in possession are attacking and transition from defending to attacking. Okay, so we have uh, in terms of here at TSC, we talk about when we're attacking, we're talking about gaining possession or starting from our defensive third. We want to build with patient possession. Um, and those two principles of play for us are value the ball with composure and breaking lines. Uh, you'll see that we have different things highlighted or bolded, and those are the things that are specific to you as goalkeepers. So when we have the ball, we want to have a good first touch. We want to be able to pass the ball over varying distances, and we want to be able to receive the ball as well. So I, get, I know first touch and receiving are similar, but our first touch will help us dictate what we're going to do with that pass. Um, we also want to keep the ball. We don't just want to always kick it out. Now, as a goalkeeper, sometimes we are just going to have to kick it out. But can we do that and keep the ball in play, not just smash it out of bounds uh, for a throw in? But again, sometimes that's the, the best solution. And then we want a willingness to keep the ball. Okay, we need goalkeepers that are field players first. And then my personal favorite is breaking lines. Can you use a pass to break pressure, advance the ball out of the back, maybe even get into another of the thirds, uh, find pockets or channels in the midfield, or even, yes, this is still considered a pass, is can you get the ball into the final third for us immediately and allow us to keep possession? Um, now think about transition from attacking to defending, okay? For you as a goalkeeper, this is gonna be dealing with the space in behind the back four, okay? Relating to what we talked about two weeks ago with that early cross that's maybe mishit or a through ball that you are able to come and get with your feet outside of the 18 and or when you take a cross in the air or you make a save, okay? And you hold it, now you're in possession, what do you do next? Can we get forward immediately? Is there a 1v1, a 2v1 that we can exploit? Okay. Or do we need to wait and let our teammates get ready? So, Coach? Well, all of this, as you can see, guys, involves playing with your feet. And, you know, Coach Lou and I are constantly harping on get better with your feet. Uh, this is the reason why, is, uh, you know, in order to – uh, to value the ball with composure. And, and as Lou said, your first touch and your turning and passing and receiving, you have to be comfortable with that ball at your feet. And in order to do this, you have to work at it on your own. So this is why, you know, we're talking about tonight, why we, we, we harp on, you know, don't just keep the ball. Don't just 
you know, play the ball with your hands, you're a goalkeeper. You need to be a player first and a goalkeeper as well. Not second, but as well. All right. So when we have the ball at our feet, we have to consider the decision-making process. Okay. And for most of these things, it's going to all happen very quickly in a matter of seconds. Okay. But some of these we can assess ahead of time when we get to the field and we have an opportunity to walk the, the pitch as well. Okay. But when we are talking about in possession, your number one priority as a goalkeeper is still to defend the goal. So anything that you do, you have to be aware of if the ball is turned over or if you don't connect that pass, or if you take a bad first touch, what could happen? Are you in a, def in a good position to defend the goal? Because at the end of the day, that's your primary role. Okay. Then we want to recognize the situation and the conditions. So, Firstly, what is the situation? Is it a restart, aka a goal kick or a free kick? Or have we regained possession? Did you make a save? Did you take a cross? Did you cut out a ball with your feet? Okay, who has the ball is also a consideration. You, a teammate, are they under pressure? Can you help them by supporting them? Um, when in the game, what does the game mean? time, score, the game plan. Is it a state cup match, a regional match, a playoff match, or is it a scrimmage, or is it a college showcase, or is it an under 11 academy game? What is the purpose of that game? Okay, do we need to win that game, or is it more about developing our ability to play with our feet as a team? Okay, and now we also have to consider the weather conditions. We play and live in an area where we get four seasons. You know, if we think back to Monday and Sunday night, we had crazy wind and rain and thunderstorms. So the sun, the rain, the snow, wind, altitude. What if you go to Colorado and play? The air's thinner. What is that going to do to the ball that you strike? Okay, the air's thinner. It'll travel a little further, guys. Um, or the temperature when it's colder. Are you able to strike the ball as clean as you would if it's 65 and sunny? Um, you know, field conditions. Is it grass? How thick is the grass? How short, how short is the grass? Um, is there water in the grass? Is it, if it's raining, is, are, is there puddles that are still playable? Uh, is there a certain part of the turf that gets waterlogged? I know at Rose Park, for example, there's a corner of one of the 18s that the field is still playable, but that, there's water there. And if you try to pass through it, it might get stuck. Um, you know, we are in the south, a lot of Bermuda grass, uh, and that has a sand base. So sand is used to fill the pitch uh, when, there's a, when there's a hole. Okay, and then organization of your team and opposition. For instance, your team, are you ready to play? Are they ready to play? Opposition, are they ready to defend? Can we quickly counter them? Do we have numbers up matchups? Do we have athletic matchups? How are they pressing? Are they sitting in? Are they letting us play? Are they inviting us to play? There is a difference there. Okay. So coach, anything? Yeah, this is all. Would you hear coaches talk about the mental aspect of the game and particularly for goalkeeping? This is the mental aspect of goalkeeping is, is knowing as much information as you can, reading what's going on, not just during the match, but prior to the match. Uh, areas of the field, as Lou says, that, that are not playable, that would get you in trouble if at the wrong time you played the ball there. Um, and as well, you know, uh, regarding the game, you know, are you up a goal and there's 10 minutes left? So what's the decision that you make there? Do we, do we try to build out of the back there or do we lump it down the field and get ourselves organized because we're trying to get out of here defending a one goal game? All of these are things that, that come into the decision-making process. This is the mental part of the game. Younger guys, this isn't going to be as easy um, to learn, but uh, it's just part of, of playing. The older guys, you're going to be expected to know this and to take all these into account before you go and goal. Spot on, Coach. And I think the other thing we have to consider, too, that's maybe not on here is for some of our younger ones, because I know we've got some real young ones on tonight, um, the build-out line, okay? That, that blue line, that red line, whichever color it's painted on those fields, that might help you uh, in learning how to read the pressure. So 
which of my teammates is open just because I have the build out line. Is there a player who's hiding right on there on that line or have they dropped off? Could I maybe bypass, you know, there's all these different things that are, are applicable, not just to older goalkeepers, but you younger ones as well. All right. So age group considerations when we have the ball. Before we even get started, let's take a look. Normally, we've got a lot more blank spaces in the U8 to U12, U13 to U15 if we look back. But here's the reality, goalkeepers. You are a soccer player who gets to use their hands in the way the game is being played now. Okay, so the expectation is a little bit different than maybe when I was, when I as a goalkeeper was coming up and definitely when Coach EB was coming up. Uh, <laughs> You know, the, the rules of the game have shifted to force the use of your feet more. Just look at where you can start as a center back or a field player. You can be inside the 18 and receive a pass on a goal kick, okay? So quickly running through this, communication wise, you must be able, regardless of how old you are, to use visual and verbal communication, whether it's a name um, or a hand, preferably both to point where you want the ball if you're asking for it back or where and who you're pointing and giving the ball to uh, when you're playing out. So now some might say, what about deception coach? Yes, I, there's a time and a place for the no look pass, but you can still call the person's name and look at another player, okay? The other team most of the time is not gonna know the names of every player on your field. Um, you have to be able to organize uh, your teammates before we play out on a restart, okay? And I say some of that for our U8, U12s, um, but especially our U12s, you, you really need to be understanding that it's okay to shift players around um, so that we're ready to play out, okay? Or if they're marked, you can just tell uh, Johnny or Sally step two steps and that'll give them an idea, hey, just stop hiding behind that defender. Okay, um, you have to be comfortable in these moments to demand the ball back. And if we think back to that first communication lecture that we talked about, um, the tone of your voice, okay, is there pressure on them? Are you helping relieve pressure in these moments? Okay, um, and we think back to another theme that's coming through is, are we ready if we lose the ball? So we're gonna ask you to play with your feet more and we have been doing that and your team coaches have been doing the same. So are you ready in case you lose the ball? Not just you, but are we ready to defend? Okay, this is a big one for me. Play age appropriate passes with both feet over varying distances, okay? Within the rules of you younger goalkeepers, you're allowed to do certain things and you're not allowed to do certain things, okay? In terms of punting the ball, we don't want to see you punting the ball and you're not allowed to punt the ball in some age groups and that's great because it forces you to learn how to pass the ball. Older goalkeepers, you've got to be able to strike the ball with both feet over varying distances and we, we heard it last week from coach John Bush, okay? Um, the number one question I get in terms of your ability to play now is, could they survive on the field as a field player? Okay, and some of you I can answer yes, and some of you I can answer no. All right, me, mm, game's too fast for me. So <laughs> um, the other thing is, can you utilize your hands? So sling throw, bowl, uh, baseball throw, we'll talk a little bit more about those in a minute, but you gotta be able to use your hands and your feet, okay? And we want you to make decisions of the best type of pass uh, within our philosophy, okay? And that is, again, gonna depend on time, score, uh, age, all right? And then the only one really where we're talking about, we're not really worried too much about it with our U8, U12 is that decision-making based on a game plan, okay? we're not necessarily worried about you guys winning every game you play. We're worried about developing you as soccer players and technically getting things right. So you got to want the ball. Okay. So that's why there's no X in that one. That's the only reason that's the only one that doesn't have an X. Um, we want everyone to be able to provide support and relieve pressure, but remember still got to protect the goal. And then 
Do we have an understanding of where the passing options are? And are we checking to see where pressure is? Don't always just want to play it because that's the right pass. But we've got to see, is it an opportunity that if I play my teammate, can they connect the next pass? Or if I give it to them, will they give it back to me? And then I can play an even better pass, okay? To shift the opponent sometimes, okay? Coach? Perfect chart here. This is, this is, this is something that you should uh, print out and study uh, every day and uh, every day for training and have a glance at it before you go to games so that you, you're mentally tuned in and, and you know what your expectations are. So, and this is, this is perfect. This is great. All right, so now we're gonna get into a little more of the pictures, which I know you guys prefer. But before we do that, we're gonna quickly, I'm not gonna go through the entire next slide because it's got different types of distribution on it. Uh, but when we put this up in the resources center, in the virtual training center, you can dive a little deeper into the explanations, okay? But um, it'll definitely be a good refresher um, for some and a learning experience for others. So we have different types of distribution we've got from our feet. So from the floor, we've got from our, with our feet from our hands. Um, and then we've got different distribution from our hands, AKA throwing the ball. So each of these has a time and a place when you're most likely to use it. So for instance, playing the ball off the ground with your feet is a goal kick. You might roll it out in front of you after you make a save, depending on the pressure Okay, or after a cross, you might receive uh, a back pass when you're providing support or when you come out and deal with a ball, a through ball with your feet. Okay, you use instep pass, laces pass, different types of driven or lofted balls. Both can be, those driven balls can be on the ground, a couple inches off the ground, in the air. You know, you might even have to bend the ball sometimes between two of the opposition. Okay, so being able to play different types of passes from the ground is extremely, extremely important and it helps you serve other goalkeepers in training. Um, from the hands, so after you make a save or claim a cross or if you deal with that deep through ball into the box, okay. Volley or punt, I'll be honest with you guys, I'm not a massive fan of a volley or a punt because it puts a ton of air on the ball. And then that your forward who's got to try to bring that down is probably going to duck their head like a turtle um, because that ball has gone straight up in the air like in the NFL and now it's coming down. So what goes up must come down and it's going to gain even more speed as it comes down. Uh, for me, the two I prefer are a drop kick. So the ball that you drop out in front of you and hit right as it comes off the ground and that's going to cut through the air it's a very good ball that we can use uh, to, with accuracy. Uh, and you know, we're seeing now this massive uh, Spanish uh, continental or South American style of distribution that's been around for ages. We're just now all admitting it's very good. It's called the side volley or the side winder, where we almost turn our body into a tabletop as we strike the ball. And it really cuts through the air about six, six, seven, eight feet off the ground, just over people's heads, and it helps you drop that ball in behind the back line um, or even play into players. And it's, it's a very effective tool. It's also extremely difficult to master. Um, throwing, again, after a save, after claiming or cutting out a cross, dealing with the space behind, the underhand bowl, the baseball or push throw, where you bring that ball up to your head and you're pushing it so that it skips in about 10, 15, 20 yards away. And then the old faithful sling throw where you're cupping the ball into your forearm, you're bringing it around and almost like a windmill launching it over various distances. So again, the details of all of this, I will have in the PowerPoint that you guys have access to. Coach, anything we're missing here? No, nope, I think this is pretty good. Uh, one thing that I would add here is, uh, particularly if you're distributing from your hands or as from your feet as well when you're passing, uh, a little tip would be the first place you look when you're distributing to a teammate is beyond him or her because you don't want to give them a ball that's going to get them 
clattered, you know, uh, or you don't want to give them a ball where the defender is too close to them and the defender steps in and takes the ball and now it's straight back at your goal. So those are areas to, to look for uh, before you play the ball, look behind whoever you're trying to play it to make sure it's a safe ball. Or as coach said before, you know, play it to them, demand it back. All right. We get the ball back. Now we can go out the other side with a better pass. Great. Awesome. So now uh, got some great feedback, use a different color. So it's easier to read these colors. So now we're talking about different types of passes. Okay. Um, and positioning that you'll be in. So if we look at the picture, we've got that white shaded area. So we're in possession, we've played a pass of some kind. Now we need to take up some sort of supporting angle uh, or position. And that's gonna generally happen in those areas. If we go anywhere outside these areas or we're super high sometimes that might happen. But if we're really much wider than this white shaded area here, then we got a long way to go if we turn the ball over, okay? Not saying you might end up, never end up out here, get the ball and dribble it back into the box, but you know, staying in this larger shaded area is generally a good idea when we're playing um, in the buildup phase, okay? Um, and the other thing too is you still gotta remember, I gotta be able to protect the goal and stay connected to the team at the same time if we think back. Now we're talking about this red area. Again, it overlaps a little bit. Okay, and this is an area where our center backs and our outside backs are going to be on the ball and we're going to be playing the ball along the ground primarily and circulating the ball, which maybe between you, the center backs and the outside backs so that we can then break into the midfield third. Um, it's just, it's a fancy term for keeping possession of the ball. Uh, and trying to shift the midfield players of the opposition. So this yellow area, this is generally where our six and our eight and maybe even our 10 are gonna get on the ball. That's why it doesn't go all the way to the touchline, okay? It's, it's inside the three central channels, okay? And if we're playing here, we're generally playing a pass on the ground and we're playing it through, okay? Between opposition players, okay? So you might be over here and play through the nine and the 11 into your six or your eight or even your 10, okay? And now you're breaking lines if we relate it back to our philosophy at the club and we're maintaining possession at the same time, okay? We're playing into this blue area. Again, it shifts. These are when we're playing passes over that front three or even front four, depending on how they're set up, okay? So that we're breaking that line over the top and we're gonna to have to go over some of our players as well. A lot of times this will be into maybe the 10, the seven, the 11 who have dropped underneath or the two and the three who have bumped higher, okay? And this can be in the air. And to be fair, it could be that mid range, you know, two or three yards off the ground as well, depending on how the opposition is set up. Playing onto, it's this green area. It's the ball we're playing in the air so that our teammates can win the ball. So I like to use the term advantage space. Can I play a pass so that even though it's in the air, my teammate can either connect that pass underneath or flick it on for another player to run onto and go 1v1 or be in on goal, okay? And then the last option is, you know, we're playing beyond the opposition's back four we're turning their backs and making them run towards their own goal while we get to run at the goal. Um, this is a fancy way of saying clear it, or I'm gonna try to isolate this player 1v1. Um, yeah, coach? Two things on this. One is when you are playing possession, trying to break lines, and you're in your back third, make sure as a goalkeeper, you got to remember that if you're passing, you're also supporting, okay? And we're going to get to this in a future slide, but, uh, it, you know, you, 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 have to, you have to be an outlet player for the, for the player who gets the ball in case they need to get it back to you. So your job's not over if you just play it to somebody's feet and then say, okay, I'm the goalkeeper now. No, you got to be a supporting player, and you got to be – 
you got to be available to get a pass back uh, and then play it out the other side so that you can break the line out of the back third. Um, second thing is when you're playing beyond, and as coach said, you're trying to isolate a 1v1, you don't necessarily most of the time have to play to that player's feet. You can play beyond them into space and let them run onto the ball. And again, as coach said, the, the, the idea here is to get the defenders running back toward their own goal, facing their own goalkeeper. You've been a goalkeeper long enough. You understand how uncomfortable that is for you as a goalkeeper. It's uncomfortable for defenders. It's definitely uncomfortable for the other goalkeeper. And so if we've got that option to, to, to do, you know, playing that ball beyond is sometimes a great choice because it puts the other team under pressure. Yes. Um, thanks, Coach. Really good there. Uh, Bonnie, real quick, the numbers on the pitch correspond to the explanations over here on, in the words, okay? And then, Finn, you asked about, do I prefer long balls or sh building out of the back? The answer is yes, and I'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, I think there's a time and a place for everything, and I think that we have – as a soccer culture and community distorted playing out of the back. Uh, I believe playing out of the back is connecting a pass that allows us to go forward and maintain possession. So building out of the back isn't just playing to my center back or my six. And I know Coach Evie and I agrees with me on that because we have had many conversations about that. Correct. Okay, so we've mentioned uh, providing support, angles of support. Now, here's just a couple different ways that you could provide support, okay? If the ball's over here on the wide channel, you could receive the ball in this red space, okay? That's within the frame of the goal, okay? There's pros and cons to this, okay? One might be if you, have a, if you miss the ball, it goes in the goal. One might be that um, it means that a ball is coming straight at you. Uh, another is there's different pressure on you, okay? If we look at the yellow area, which is one we see a lot, is I'm shifting wide of the frame of the goal, which also might have to do with the pressure. There might be the number nine in this pocket of space here. So I'm going to change my angle of support while still remaining close enough to get back to the goal. Okay, and now I give myself a little bit better angle to receive the ball. It makes my three in this instance have an easier pass back to me. And then it also might allow my four or my five to come up in this high pocket of space here. And now we have still have a triangle. And now this nine would have to figure out what to do. Okay, the other option is I could step higher than the frame of the goal. Okay. And this would be the opposite side the ball is on. And again, it's just another option, but we also have to be wary of where is the nine or the 10 or the 11 or the seven of the opposition? Are they gonna come press me if I step higher? So uh, these two, the yellow and the red are most easy to utilize. This opposite side of the frame is a tougher, um, concept to grasp and that's also going to come down to how your team coach wants you to act as a goalkeeper um, some coaches are happy with you being higher than the center backs others are not going to be cool with that whatsoever and again that's going to fit into club philosophy but also within a, each individual team philosophy um, so okay coach anything on this yeah, a couple of things. This is a great uh, example, great diagram of why uh, you need to develop both your feet. And uh, because as you can see, you're going to be swinging left or swinging right uh, and in and passing and then in support. Um, so, you know, that's why, you know, again, keep harping back to the same thing, but that's why you need to develop both feet like we talked about last week with John. Uh, the other thing is, you know, everything that you're seeing here and everything that coach was talking about, bear in mind that you're 
you're supporting and you're moving through these uh, positions with half of your brain saying, I've got to protect the goal in case something breaks down here. So you don't want to go scurrying way outside of, to the parameters because if, you're, if your teammate who you're passing to makes a mistake or the pass isn't good, you've got to be able to defend the goal. Uh, so you've got to sort of keep that in, on one side of your brain while the other side of your brain is playing possession and, and trying to break lines out of the back third. Exactly, Coach. And I think the, the biggest thing, if I'm ever going to leave the frame of the goal, I need to make eye contact. Okay, I need to make eye contact with the player on the ball so that they see me leaving the goal. So they don't just pass it right where they think I was or where I should be. All right, so now we're going to go through just if we look again, we look at the colors on the left, they match with colors on the pitch. Okay, and we're just going to go through three different systems of play here, formations of play. So 4-3-3 is the first one. And we're just doing it if we start from a goal kick. Okay. And again, the two is the outside back on the right side. Our four is our right center back. Our five is our left center back. Our three is our left back. Our six is our holding mid. Our eight is our box to box midfielder. They could drop in and be a second six or they could be that second 10. We have our number 10, our attacking mid, our right winger or our right midfielder, our seven, our number nine, AKA the goal scorer and the 11, the left winger. Okay, so I hope that answers that question for you there, Bonnie. And when we get into different formations, obviously those numbers are gonna shift a little. Um, but if the one thing I want you guys to really notice about these passing colors is that depending on where you play them, so if you play the front foot of a player, you're playing into them. If you're playing the back foot, now they're facing the goal. So you're playing, you're not asking them to turn, you're asking them to play around and keep the ball. And I can play into my six and they could play it back. I could play through so my six can get out. Same thing with my, I could play over, uh, so into the eight, or I could play through to the eight, okay? Again, the nine and seven and 11, you know, or even the 10 maybe, I could be playing on, onto, beyond, through, okay? It's just gonna depend, because I mean, I didn't draw the yellow lines here, but depending on the strength of your leg and the passing lane that's open, you could drive that ball in on the ground and it'd be a through different players, guys. Okay. Um, but these are just some of the most common in this uh, formation. And then the other thing to think about is, are we ready to play? Can we play up? Can I exploit? That's how we decide which type of these passes that we're going to place. And we'll, we'll go through some examples later on. So I don't want to try to create them without the opposition, but I want to give you an idea that when we put that ball down in the middle of the six, whether you toss it out in front of you, which takes some practice or you run up, set it down, which then might give your team a chance to get organized. Okay. What are you looking for as you scan the field while you're going from off the pitch to the center of the six yard box. Okay. And again, sometimes you might just need to put it down and play it real quick and short. Again, I, I understand that, but these are some themes we're looking for ball in the middle of the six. Are you scanning? Can you play quick or do you need to slow it down? Okay. Can you uh, isolate? So Finn, I hope this helps right here. Um, I, I think this is all playing out of the back, especially if, I go beyond and my seven gets on the ball. You've connected a pass in my analysis. Coach? Yeah, this is a perfect, this is again, a perfect chart on uh, the expectations of where you can play. Don't forget, you know, you can also, if you've, if you've caught a, made a save or caught a cross, you know, you can play any of these passes with a throw. And uh, so again, as coach says, if you're, now, usually when you're throwing, you're throwing in front of the player because you're trying to spring them open to attack. You're very rarely going to throw to a player and get the ball back, right? But any of these areas that, you know, you're, you're, if you decide to throw 
or half volley or drop kick, whatever you want to call it, it's still basically the same chart here. And it's still basically the same decisions that you're making. Yep. Um, if we go to a 442, now some might say, Coach Lou, your 442 looks really weird because you've got two here and then you've got, well, if I'm playing out, I want to get my wingers high. Okay. Or you might play a diamond. So you've got a 10, a six and a narrow midfield. Okay. So that's going to change this. But again, notice multiple different options corresponding to the colors. And again, with a back four, you're going to see more of a, of playing around here. Okay. All right. And again, look, there's even a red line here into the six and they might play out here. They might bounce it back to you. Okay, they might bounce it there and then come back around. Okay, again, you make a save like Coach Evie mentioned. You can run up here and bowl it out. You can throw, you could put it down and strike the ball. Okay, these passes don't mean it's from the ground all the time. Okay, it's just a good diagram to help you. Okay, and this is my ideal shape to start, but then the game gets fluid and it happens and things change. The other thing you have to consider is what are your strengths? Okay, if I think about Alyssa Nair, and probably the biggest reason why she's the starter for the US Women's National Team is she can throw the ball beyond midfield. Okay, so that is sometimes a quicker option than a side volley, a drop kick, letting everyone run out, putting the ball down, striking it. Okay, that is a massive tool that she is able to use as a defining quality that gets her on the pitch over other quality goalkeepers like Jane Campbell, Aubrey Bledsoe, Ashlyn Harris, or A.D. Frank. Okay, you're talking about someone who they're all great goalkeepers, but she can throw the ball 60 yards. Okay, it's almost, it's just another weapon that she has in distribution. Okay, coach. Yeah, I, I mean, this is again uh, with you with your with your four backs, you're actually giving yourself better numbers to uh, to knock the ball around, as coach says, and um, uh, again, sort of building on the uh, on the story about Alyssa. You know, it used to be back when in the old days when Peter Schmeichel was playing for Manchester United and they had Ryan Giggs, they actually had a breakout play that if Schmeichel got caught the ball, he would throw to the, to the corner of midfield either way. And if it was to Giggs, you know, it was a breakout play. It was basically a get the ball, get it to Giggs, and we go forward play uh, because it was able to leave players behind the ball. So if you've got that ability and it's okay with your coach, that's, you know, again, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to harp on it, but making the other team uncomfortable when we're attacking is what we want. And uh, so, you know, if it's on, do it. Now here we have our uh, last little one is a three, five, two. This is probably one of my favorite formations um, to coach, to be a goalkeeper in because you have three center backs and you have wing backs. And the, the biggest thing I want to, to show you guys here is if you're playing this, Okay, you can have your wing back start high and they can either go into space, go beyond, go onto, so you can play into them and they can knock it down for the six, 10, okay, or the eight. Uh, or they can drop in underneath and provide another option uh, to play around, okay? But if you look at this, it's, there's more options to play through, there's more options to play into. Um, there's just a lot of different options in this. Um, but the biggest thing here, this right here is my third center back. I don't need them right here. I can be the pivot between the two of the center backs. Now we have a diamond. Now we have another diamond in the center of the park. And we've got all these different passing options. So I could play into there, bounce there, and now we're out. Okay. So there's so many different options. Now, again, it's extremely difficult uh, formation to play, but I think it's a great formation to also, as a goalkeeper, learn to communicate, but that's not really the focus tonight. But um, that's the biggest key for this. And um, yeah, I don't think we need to really harp anymore on that, Coach. I want to 
You know, yeah, no, right? that's perfect. So, uh, but yeah, again, guys, this is all going up on the virtual training center. So now we'll get into some actual examples here. Okay. And a little different this week is we've got a couple different options shown on the same slide. Okay. So we're going to take it first from a goal kick because we think about that is the, the quintessential in possession moment for a goalkeeper, especially in today's game. Okay. Um, and you know, some coaches, uh, we'll, we'll disagree a little bit on, on what I'm going to say, and some will agree 100%. Uh, it's just knowing what your team's philosophy is within the club philosophy of, of maintaining possession. So um, I'm going to jump to the green option, which is playing onto from the start, okay? If we look at where our 11 is, our left winger here, Okay, and we look at where the back four of the opposition is, where the midfielders are, the six and the eight and the 10 for them. They're dealing with these three players and we've dragged over here. So this player's ideally gonna go there. The nine is kind of trying to decide where to go because we've put the ball here in the middle. Okay, now we have the seven who's left our outside back who's bumped up free. So I, if I have the physical ability to play over everything or even play through, cause there's a lovely window, I can drive the ball in here. And when uh, Haley gets pressured by the two, she can knock it down. It's a two V one. The nine comes across. Now it's three V two. Okay. That is still building out of the back guys, because I've played a pass where my teammate can then connect another pass. Um, and we have entered into the midfield third and could potentially even go immediately into the attacking third if they flicked it on or if they set it for our outside back to run onto and overlap, okay? That's one option. But let's say that's not in your locker because of physical strength or the build out line if you're playing 7v7 um, or your coach has said, I don't want you to do that. I want you to play shorter passes first uh, because we're in, depending on what time of the game, okay? So one option would be this first option and I have them labeled A1 and A2 for these red ones. So again, that's gonna be something when you go in it'll be a little easier to remember, okay? So let's say I play my first pass and I try to play into my six, but this pressure comes after they, this player comes with my six. So my six ends up bouncing it back to the center back, my four. I've changed my position to provide good support. I get on the ball and I wanna, oh, the nine's there. I can't play, I can't play there. So I play it across the 18. And then after I play, I continue to move up bang, the sevens come on that center back, they play it back to me. But now again, that's left my, my three open and I play onto, into them in the middle third. And now we've broken their press. We've taken four, five players out for them. One, two, three, four. Okay, depending on how high this player has bumped, that's four players out of the game for them. Now they're running towards their own goal and I've got all this space in the wide channel, okay? At any point in this, this nine could come crazy and I might have to go on to or beyond, okay? But maybe I just take a peek and I see that I could play my seven, okay? Another option is again, I play there into my six. Again, it comes back with the press or it comes straight back to me. And now, oh, the center, this, the nine is coming at me because to cut the field in half and I can play through one, two, bang, and now I've got options to turn out and I have two more players that I can play with, okay? Again, these are just a couple options, goalkeepers, and they're not the only solution. Your coach might have a pattern of play or a couple patterns that they like to work on. And again, you can use playing around, playing through and playing into and onto in all these moments, and that's okay, okay? but understanding what kind of pass you might have to do 
and looking beyond just the first two center backs or my outside backs or my six, that has to really happen. Okay. And then the other thing to consider is time and score. Okay. We're winning one, nothing state cup. There's four minutes left. I'm going to milk every second I can. I'm going to jog over, slowly get the ball. I'm going to slowly put the ball down in the middle rather than toss it out so I can play quick. I'm going to make sure I methodically count my steps back. I'm going to shift a couple players left and right so that I have a better angle. And then honestly, I'm, oh, never mind. I'm going to step them up, get in nice and compact, shift them to one side, and smash it into a channel. Okay. And that is okay if we're managing a game when we're talking about an event we're trying to win. I'm not talking about a college showcase. I'm not talking about a just a regular tournament. I'm talking about a state cup where we're talking about going to regions. I'm talking about a ECNL playoff game. I'm talking about a state cup, a state final high school game, a state playoff game. Okay, we're not talking about your 11 v 11 or you know, our, our 11 v 11 scrimmages within the club. We're talking about games that have a result that have an actual impact in terms of going to the next round, okay? Um, in this moment too, you know, Theo asks a great question. You've got to understand how your players like to receive the ball, but then in some situations, they have to understand that receiving with their left foot is going to allow them to go forward even though they're right-footed. Okay, or receiving with my chest and deflecting it down because that's the best way to get the ball to them. Uh, so we can keep the ball. They're going to have to be adaptable, just like we're asking you as goalkeepers to be adaptable. Coach? Okay, so here's something to ponder, guys. Coach Lou always gives us these great diagrams with the dotted lines and the, and the channels. And, the, and on this field, for example, there's a bunch of grids. I mean, you're not going to see this on the field that you're playing on, but you can envision this in your mind. If you look at this field with the dotted line grids, if I'm the goalkeeper, am I going to play the ball into a grid that has a lot of people, both my team and the other team? Probably not. I'm going to try to play the ball into a grid or an area that has one of my team one of their team, and now we got a 2v1. Or as Coach said, now we've got numbers up. Now we've got a 3v2 in a triangle. Okay, so if you can, just looking at this diagram, or this, yeah, this diagram, I'm thinking, okay, this is great, because if you can envision this when you're playing, you know, my advice to you would be don't play a ball into a grid where there's a lot of people, because it increases the chances of the ball getting taken away. Play the ball into a grid where it's a 1v1 situation or maybe we have numbers up. Maybe we have two, they have one. And that's the grid to play to. Uh, uh, and again, that is, you know, not taking into account uh, time of the game, status of the game, importance of the game. But this is a great setup in that you can see areas that maybe – maybe you want to bypass with your passing because or with your distribution because there's just too many people in there spot on coach and i think that's a really simple way of describing a very difficult uh decision making process and i think the other thing guys too is you have to remember that sometimes playing around allows these pictures to change, which then gives you that numbers up situation you're looking for. Um, and the other thing to remember is if we're going to build out, we're going to make mistakes, we're going to turn the ball over. And that's part of learning and growing as players. And our coaches know that and your coaches know that too. So if they're going to ask you to build out and stay in this defensive third a little bit, they know that it might mean a mistake's going to happen. And that's okay. Okay, that's how we learn and how we get better at recognizing how the picture changes for us. Okay, so again, this isn't the only option. This is just a picture I've created after taking a cross. Okay, and it'd be similar if you made a, a, a save from close range. So the ball starts out here in the wide channel. It's delivered in. You have fantastic range. You get all the way out here to eight yards outside the box because, you know, you've read that ball. And now there's one, two, three players of the opposition that are 
between you and the top of the 18. But if you run immediately to the top of the 18 or somewhere central, and you are scanning as you run, not before you take the cross, which you could glance quickly to see where the opposition is, where your teammates are, because that's gonna change once you take the cross. You're running and you're scanning from right to left, okay? Because we wanna look opposite side first. And we see different pictures here, okay? Um, for me, the first look is, can I go, can I get us in 1v1? Okay, I have the ability to play a sidewinder accurately and my nine, I know that Hannah is super fast. So she's gonna immediately, once I take that cross, start to bend her run. And I'm just gonna put her in this pocket and say, good luck, cause she's super fast, okay? Okay, but that doesn't happen because this center back immediately starts to drop off. So it's a one versus two and I'm not really confident center of the field because we've also got the goalkeeper to deal with this space. So I look and I've got two options. I could play into my eight or, or my 10, sorry. And as they spin out, bang, now it's a two V two or three V two. If we consider my seven uh, involved as well. Okay. But the other really good option that I would probably look to first in this picture is I can play onto this space here. Okay. Even with this player coming up, I think my player is going to be able to bend their run and either flick it into space for themselves or onto, knock it down to the 10 or flick it into this space for the nine. Okay. But we're again, three V one, 3v2, depending on how you want to picture it. And we haven't even talked about the, the third man run from our 11 who's going to be bombing into this space, okay? Again, if this doesn't, if none of these things happen because they immediately drop or you don't get to the top of the box quick enough or you're physically unable to play certain passes, that's okay. Wait, let us get organized and then we can try to build through. Or you hold, you're looking, you're scanning, and as we get up, oh, maybe they, maybe this three drops all the way back and the 11 is slow and now you can throw or bowl the ball out to the outside back, the two, and now they're in, okay? So different layers of things that happen based on how quickly or how slowly you decide to play, okay? But the biggest thing is I've got to scan in order to make any of these decisions. Coach? Love this diagram because this is, this is A, the proper uh, choice on your possession, I mean, on your distribution after your possession. And if anybody, we don't have a group here, we can answer it. But the reason is, look where the other goalkeeper is. Okay, so we get the ball and we quickly get it out to that player out there that Lou was talking about. Now we got this guy or girl running backwards, trying to organize things. Okay, and that's, again, you're making it uncomfortable for everybody who's now defending because they don't have the ball. So, uh, again, and as Lou just said, you've, as you, and, and little guys, we're not expecting you to do this because this, this comes with experience. But older goalkeepers, we are expecting you to be able to scan the whole field. And if you catch a goalkeeper out like this, then let's try to exploit it. Okay. And you get across here, you get it quickly out to the other side. And now we got everybody running backwards in a, in a panic. That's what we want when we're attacking. And it all started from you. Yep. And I think coach, coach makes a really good point, guys. The, the goalkeeper is something you have to look for as well and consider how is that goalkeeper played? Um, just because a goalkeeper is up here uh, on the right in the middle and attack, that doesn't mean that they're quick enough to run out here if the ball gets all the way here. They, or they may not be a, allowed to their coach may put a parameter on they've got to drop right back okay or they may be super quick and play like Hugo Lloris for Tottenham in France and come flying out there and smash the ball out of bounds um, or play the ball into here so those are things again awareness that we've talked about in other uh, webinars is that we've got to be aware of what the other goalkeeper can do not just what the other team's defenders can do or attacking players can do your head's always on a swivel. And lastly, this is our last little uh, diagram for tonight, goalkeepers. And this one, yes, it says after dealing with space behind back line, 
but you could also consider it if this player regained the ball and played it back to you. Okay, now we've just shifted up the field and again, the same passes. So um, again, now you've dealt with that early ball in, you were, maybe you started here and you ran out and you had plenty of time. And now we've got a couple different options. The other team could be continue their runs and press slow, or they could press fast, okay? But if they press slow, you've got time to take a touch. Let's bait them in, let's bring them in. You, so that comfortability on the ball allows us to get into shape and you can play through to one of your center backs or your six and now they've got different options or you could play into um, those this the eight uh, or the 11 based on or the seven based on these pictures and they've got players they can combine with okay or if the nine and 11 are pressing fast or slow, doesn't matter, but, and then the two or the three or the four and the five are all stepping up really fast out of control. You might want to play on to our, 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 our teammate Haley over here who can then knock the ball into space for the nine Hannah to run into or Megan can release and get the ball overlapping. Okay. And now we're numbers up again. So again, this is gonna come with what is the opposition doing? How comfortable are you playing in one or two touches? And what does your coach want you to do in this moment, okay? Um, but I think one thing that we have to understand is that it, my first touch in this moment has to allow my next action to be a pass, okay? It can't be too far in front where I have to take three steps. It can't be too tight where I can't drive that ball onto or beyond, but it also has to allow me to play around or through or into this moment. These are the three options I would want to see, but around might be the best option if they decide to just stop. If that team automatically stops, they're organized. So now we've got to play around or through and try to break them down. Okay. But again, within our principles, our, our, of play at the club, we want to try to exploit immediately after regaining possession of the ball. So again, thinking back to those principles that your coaches are teaching you, we're trying to do the same thing within our goalkeeping program. Um, coach, anything before we open it up real quick? No, I think that's great. And, and I, this, in this diagram, everything we've been talking about is coming true now. Now you're playing, now you're part of the attack. Now you're playing it around and you're, you're part of the, the initial attack against the other team and and again you know it comes back to awareness it comes back to being able to play with your feet it comes back to uh the way your coach wants to play fantastic all right so we'll open it up uh goalkeepers what uh any questions uh we'll stop the the screen share and show you evie and i's face so Ask away, goalkeepers. Any questions? We've all gone quiet. We've all gone quiet, coach. Yeah, we've all gone quiet. Or, or we're just getting really good at answering the question. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, that must be it. Yeah. You know. Ah, there we go. From Ethan Drew, how cautiously should we be when a defender plays it back to take space? So I think, Coach, this question is a good one because it's talking about a trend we're seeing in the professional game where, where a goalkeeper gets the ball and now they start to dribble forward to penetrate, uh, invite players in. Uh, to press. And, you know, I think, Ethan, that's going to come down to how comfortable you are on the ball. Um, it's going to come down to the time and score of the game. It's going to come down to, I think it's going to come down to how much you're trying to play through rather than 
play into or onto. So I think if you're trying to keep the ball on the ground 100% of the time, then you're going to have to do a little bit more of the of taking space. Um, but you can also say the same thing if you want to go beyond. If they're going to drop off, you can take a touch that's two or three yards, and now you've gained a couple of yards of ground. Hopefully that invites some pressure, and maybe that opens up an option to go through onto beyond. Um, Coach, what do you think? Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think the one thing you got to be careful of here, Ethan, is not careful of, but aware of, is, um, y- you know, you play within the parameters that your team coach is asking you guys to play under. And uh, you want to make sure that if you're starting to steal ground, if you're starting to develop as a, as a group where you're playing the ball around and you're stealing ground, that you're practicing that in training so that all of a sudden it doesn't happen in a game because your, your defenders have to be comfortable with where you are with the ball and where they are waiting to receive the ball. And if you push too far, like Lou says, now you've got defenders who are uncomfortable. They're not quite confident. You play them the ball, they, they give it away because they're just not a ready for it or be comfortable getting it. Now you're probably out of position and uh, you've, so now you've made work for yourself. Okay. So this is something that needs to be trained at with your team. Uh, it needs to be trained at uh, with your back three or four, whatever you're playing. Um, and, and so that, you know, it's not a, it's not kind of a surprise during the match. That's, that's, that's what I would be a little bit aware of going forward. Yeah. Um, great. Uh Kylie asks, how effective do you think the baseball slash push throw is in a game situation? Um, For me, I utilized it a lot um, because it's a really good tool when you're running out and you're trying to put a outside back or a winger uh, into space and allow them to drive forward um, because it's easier to get distance and skip the ball into their path um, without a loop that you would do if you're trying to do a bowl over distance, but you don't want to necessarily do a sling throw when you're throwing the ball 20, 30 yards uh, and you're trying to get it on the ground quickly, you know, um, or even anything from 15 yards. Coach, what do you think? I think I agree. And, And the key here, Kylie, is, you know, as Lou said, you've caught the ball, you're running, you're leaving players behind the ball now. You're trying to quickly get the ball out to the feet of your teammate to basically start a counterattack maybe, but start a, you know, start a counter possession, maybe a better term. And the key is you catch the ball and you start moving, you know, um, because as Lou says, it's about, it's usually a, a baseball push pass is usually about a 10 to 15 yard pass where, your 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 end goal is to settle the ball at the feet at the front foot of the play of your teammate that you're playing to. Yeah, it's a uh, yeah. It's I think it's a very very underutilized tool it is. Uh, um, in the game. Um, Mr. Campbell asked, "Who is the best pro goalkeeper with their distribution?" in your opinion, uh, so I can watch them. Great question. Um, For me, um, you know, the easy answer is Ederson uh, or, you know, the easy answer is Ederson or Ter Stegen. I I think Ter Stegen is absolutely fantastic um, with with his feet. Um, his decision-making is also based around the philosophy of the German sweeper keeper, but also within Barcelona's methodology of, uh, you know, very much, um, break lines, keep possession. I, I think Ter Stegen is great for our goalkeepers to watch, um, because of his accuracy, um, and effectiveness with both feet. And then there's actually a goalkeeper who just signed for the Houston Dynamo, another German goalkeeper, very young, 24 years old. 
His name is Marco, and I, his last name is slipping my mind there, Campbell. Um, but he is his uh, his comfortability with the ball uh, is going to be something that teams in MLS are not going to be ready for because um, based on some conversations I've had with those guys down there at Houston, he is willing to take the ball and make a mistake and it's not going to flap him even if it leads to a goal. Um, so once we get back to the MLS, I think he's great to, to watch. And if you can look him up, uh, I'm sorry, I don't remember his last name, guys, but he is tremendous. And then on the women's side, I think um, Jane Campbell, who we had on, has fantastic feet. Uh, I also think Aubrey Bledsoe is another fantastic goalkeeper to, to watch. Um, Coach, what about you? I think Manuel Neuer is in that, in that boat. Uh, very good with his feet. I think I kind of agree with Coach Lou. He, he's, a, he's a really good goalkeeper that plays with his feet, but Ter Stegen springs people free, I think, better with his distribution. Um, and again, it all, you know, it all comes down to Campbell, how, you know, what they're trying to accomplish as a team. Um, uh, but, you know, depending upon your coach, if I'll give, I'll give you an example, a great player who can quickly hit the long ball for a fast break, using American terms here, uh, but is Allison from Liverpool. You know, he, he gets the ball, looks long, and if it's on, because, you know, he, he knocks it up there and because he's got Mo Salah up front. And so if, if it's on, he goes, you know, uh, and, he, and he can deliver the ball on the, in the path of the runner. Um, so, again, it just depends on, on you know, what kind, of, uh, what kind of formation, what kind of tactics the team is using. But any of those guys, um, you know, are, are excellent. I think, I think Neuer's good, but you've, Neuer's great at knocking the ball around. You very rarely see him hit a penetrating pass that, that breaks lines like we've been talking about tonight. But, you know, yeah. he's good. I mean, he's not – you know, that's not to say he can't do it. He just – that's not what they've asked him to do. I was hesitant to, to bring Allison in because I, I don't really want to give Coach Greg any more ammunition about Liverpool being so good. <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> uh, Jack, Jack's helped me out here. It's Marco Marich. Uh, oh, marriage. Okay. M A R K O. Last name M A R I C. Thanks, Jack. Big time. Uh, and then you know, a question, Campbell. You asked another great question that I know a lot of other the goalkeepers will ask: Is how do I improve my technique uh, of distributions? And you know, the biggest thing is you've got a soccer ball. You might have a bag of soccer balls. You know, I think you might be. In the minority, I'm pretty sure your dad probably has 40 or 50 soccer balls of varying sizes, uh, or at least access to them. You know, I think he's a coach. Uh, and going to the field or the driveway and striking the ball um, and focusing on different techniques and going, uh, YouTube is a great source for how-to tutorials. The other thing is asking Coach EV, Coach Lou, Coach Marissa, Coach Rebecca, Coach Chris, Coach Jeanette, any goalkeeper coach we have at the club can help you with your technique. Um, and I think what it comes down to is repetition. Um, and, you know, just like when you, uh, what's a good example? When you, uh, you know, when you, when you tie your shoe properly, you know it instantly. Um, but when you, it's wrong, you untie it and retie it. And when you strike a ball well, you can feel it. And the idea is to go out and practice that and over and over on a, a daily basis and every other day basis um, and track that in that journal that we talked about uh, last week um, so that you can look back and reflect on how much you've actually practiced the different techniques and then when we get back on the field, you have practiced or you continue to practice, then you, at the end of a goalkeeper training, hey coach, look at this technique real quick and we can give you some pointers that way. That's the, that's the best way. But again, you don't need practice official to, to work on it. You just need to go and try it. And it's gonna be weird, especially with that awkward foot. 
Um, and you've got to use both feet. I mean, I'm, I, if you watch any professional or college goalkeeper at the highest levels or youth national team, they can use both feet. Um, I'm not saying you got to be able to drop kick or volley the ball with both feet, but it might, it doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt, but you got to be at least proficient with a wide variety of distributions with your strong foot. And then with, um, your weak foot, you've got to be able to at least strike from the ground uh, with that weak foot over distance. And a backup plan in case you roll your ankle or, or break a toe, but you can still play, you might not want to be striking the ball with that strong foot. So, Coach? Yeah, I think everything you've said is 100% correct. The other thing you might want to do, Campbell, is, is you know, when you get proficient or more and more proficient, you know, practice playing the ball to different spaces, to different areas, to different targets, you know, pick a tree in the backyard and see how many times you can hit it from 20 yards away, you know, on, on the fly, you know, uh, if you, you know, go get a, go get a hula hoop or a rope and make a circle and be 30 yards away and see how many balls you can drop into that circle, uh, from your kicks, uh, or your throws or, you know, whatever you're trying to do. Um, that's, that's the kind of stuff that you can do on your own to get better and better at it. That's a great, I love the tree. It just reminds me of Paul Scholes from class of 92. I mean, that is, you know, pick a target. Doesn't have to be a goal all the time, guys. Doesn't have to be, uh, the perfect setup. Um, and you don't always need 120 yards to practice technique. Um, so Coach, I think uh, I think that's it for tonight. Um, and we will wrap it up. But again, thank you to my co-host, uh, Director of Goalkeeping along with me, Eric Vauder. Uh, and again, this information will all be on our TSC YouTube channel and the PowerPoint will be up in the virtual training center and the resources page on play metrics. Have a great weekend, everyone. And we will see you next week with another episode of fireside chat. Have a great night.